Thank you. You know, uh, there was, um, many of you may have remembered or, or know Don Castell, who is a famous esophagologist and a wonderful speaker. He used to talk about uh, the definition of a professor is somebody who speaks in other people's sleep. We kind of modify it in these sessions is a professor is somebody who speaks in other people's eats. So uh, enjoy, the chew quietly, and we'll get along. So before Miguel takes us ahead and moves towards the uh, in, in, uh, positioning newer therapies into our therapeutic armamentarium, obviously this morning I talked about one of the older therapies, but now we're going to talk about how we've evolved our management strategies, as uh, Russell mentioned, from step up now to a more treat to target approach. But we've had many years and over 20 years of biologic therapy with the TNF inhibitors uh, to begin understanding more about the progression of these diseases. And indeed, what, when I talked about the thiopurines this morning, most of the analyses of those were based on symptoms. And you're very familiar that, as you saw, the newer data that's uh, evolved with the TNF inhibitors, the other biologics, and the JAK inhibitors, we're moving well beyond the treatment of symptoms of alone. alone. Uh, we're now moving more towards target treat, not only treating to targets with targeted therapies, but evolving from that step-up approach. So through the math, past number of decades, we've learned a number of things about treatment of IBD. One is, watch your back. Yeah, thank you. Um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are both chronic and progressive. We don't have a cure for either of these diseases, aside for surgery with ulcerative colitis. And we know that Crohn's disease evolves from a primarily luminal disease to transmural disease with strictures and fistula. Similarly, ulcerative colitis progresses. It can progress to a lead pipe colon, can progress over time, if not treated effectively, to risk of colon cancer and neoplasia. We've also learned, as I just mentioned, that the symptoms don't necessarily reflect the inflammatory burden. Indeed, 20% of the patients who were entered into the ACCENT study, the first maintenance study of infliximab in Crohn's disease, and 20% of the patients who were entered into the SONIC study comparing infliximab alone, infliximab with azathioprine or azathioprine alone, 20% of those patients had no endoscopic disease. They were entered based on symptoms. And when you look back at those patients, it made no impact on their, there was no differentiation uh, between uh, disease, drug and placebo in those patients without uh, endoscopic disease. I'm going to show you data how treating to biologic, to biologic targets actually improve long-term outcomes. It's also very important, and we are talking about first-line agents. We need to move from first-line biologics to first-line agents in these diseases if we're really going to impact on their long-term uh, efficacy and outcomes. And using um, PK and uh, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and understanding that, as we've heard a lot and will continue to discuss at this meeting, is going to improve outcomes. But we need to make the best of our first therapy. Because as you've seen with every biologic and with tofacitinib to come, bio-exposed patients don't do as well as bio-naive patients. And there's evidence, increasing evidence, that the early we, or we treat, the better the outcomes are going to be. So our standard therapies and our early biologics for inflammatory bowel disease are well known to you. We've been discussing them for today and for the past several years. I'm not going to go into individual details. But through the years, up until recently, we've used this step-up approach, or sequence, sequencing therapies. For patient, and it's based on two factors. It's based on the disease, quote, severity, which is under discussion, as well as the refractoriness. How have patients done with each treatment? So for mild ulcerative colitis, 
we're typically starting with uh, amino salicylates, oral or rectal or combination, or uh, budesonide has also been effective. In patients who achieve remission with these therapies, we continue them on a long-term basis. For patients who haven't responded to salicylates, or if they present with moderate disease or moderate severity, that's when we would add corticosteroids. But as you know, steroids are a game changer. Once patients start on steroids, 80% are going to be refractory or dependent on steroids. So we need a maintenance agent. We often will try amino salicylates, but as I mentioned this morning, thiopurines are actually a more effective maintenance strategy. For patients who don't respond to corticosteroids, that's where we have been positioning the uh, biologic therapies. Anti-TNFs, anti-integrins most recently, um, uh, the uh, ustekinumab recently, and um, Miguel's going to be talking about tofacitinib. Once those patients achieve remission, the question is, do we need to maintain combination therapy, or can we switch to monotherapy, or just continue the same drug? And then, eventually, if they fail, uh, they may need cyclosporin or surgery. Similarly, in Crohn's disease, but the problem is we don't really have good first-line drugs for mild to moderate Crohn's disease. Salicylates haven't been effective in clinical trials, although they're commonly used. <coughs> Excuse me, budesonide is approved for short-term use. Thank you, Russ. Is approved for short-term use, but not effective on a long-term basis, at least at safe and effective doses. And one of the biggest questions is, what do you do for patients who get into a remission with these first-line therapies? Again, patients with more moderate to severe disease are uh, transferred to corticosteroids or initiated on steroids, but require maintenance with either thiopurine or, as we're hearing, methotrexate. The patients who don't respond to steroids, again, are positioned to one of the biologic therapies, TNF inhibitors, anti-adhesion or anti-cytokine therapy, and these are continued usually on a maintenance basis. And then if they don't respond, we move to a resection. So what has been the advantages and disadvantages of this approach? Well, the patients will achieve remission, clinical remission, with potentially less toxic therapy. And the more toxic, targeted therapies are reserved for patients who don't respond. This may minimize the risk of adverse events, but it also encourages a risk of more progressive disease. And the conventional therapies may be cost savings, but only in the patients who achieve your target. The disadvantages is, are that patients have to earn a more effective therapy rather than starting with an effective therapy from the beginning. We, the, this approach has treated according to symptoms, not biologic markers, and has not changed the natural history of disease towards risks of surgery or hospitalization. So most recently, the AGA has risk stratified patients for both ulcerative colitis and for Crohn's disease. And that risk stratification for ulcerative colitis is based on the risk for an eventual colectomy. And we used to say that these factors are, are like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. They're hard to define, but you know it when you see it. The low risk patients are the patients who have limited disease, superficial inflammation. The patients with a higher risk have more extensive disease, deep ulcers, and are ex-smokers or have had complications such as C. difficile. So the clinical pathway for our, from the AGA bases patients on these risks. The low-risk patients are initiated with the step up of mesalamine therapies or budesonide to begin with, but the higher-risk patients, the patients who present with more moderate disease, extensive disease, deep ulcers, ex-smokers are not going to respond to misalamine as a therapy, and with here we need to um, go to the more effective strategies, and those strategies have been listed but not prioritized, because up until very recently, we did not have head-to-head -head studies. Now, of course, the varsity study that was discussed this morning and will continue to be discussed was the first head-to-head -head study comparing 
vedolizumab to a TNF inhibitor, but the guidelines haven't had quite time to, to adapt to that. And that may allow us to begin prioritizing uh, therapy for patients with moderate to severe disease. Similar in Crohn's disease, the milder patients, it's not based on the risk of colectomy, but it's a risk of surgery or progressing, uh, progression of disease. And they're very similar. Superficial disease, limited disease tend to be low risk. Patients with deep ulcers, extensive disease, smokers, and those who present with complications are at high risk for progression. The AGA pathway suggests budesonide as a first-line therapy, but we really are left with questions as to how do we uh, maintain those individuals. But for the moderate to severe patients, these are individuals who are uh, suggested to initiate therapy with more effective strategies, again, listed. Steroids with immunosuppressives, uh, anti-TNFs with or without immunosuppressives, vedolizumab with or without immunosuppressives, ustekinumab with or without immunosuppressives, but they are not ranked because we do not yet have sufficient head-to-head -head data regarding these. So what have we learned about the biologics? We've learned that they've been targeted, they've been approved for moderate to severe disease for patients not responding to conventional agents or a first biologic, or first TNF. And what has that resulted in it? It's resulted in steroid refractory and steroid dependent patients who have all the risks of steroids and none of the benefits. It pushes treatment, effective treatment out to a longer period of time, for a longer period of time when patients are evolving the transmural complications, particularly in Crohn's disease. And what we've learned is that we have less than a 50% remission rate for these next generation therapies. Now, we've all seen this slide numerous times through numerous years, but I would advocate that there are two points in time where we can be effective in changing the course of the disease. Our opportunities are, number one, early, before complications, and number two, postoperatively. So patients who are failing three biologics, I'm thinking, what can I operate on to make them better? Because the likelihood of them responding to a fourth biologic is like a snowball surviving in Orlando. Where are the drugs indicated? Disease not responding to therapies, and that's pushed the disease duration out in clinical trials of Crohn's disease to 10 years or beyond. These patients already have complications and transmural disease. So we have evolved to this treat-to-target strategy. We've evolved this from hypertension and diabetes, we're targeting biologic activity. Blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, changes the long-term course of those diseases. It's an iterative process. We select a target, we try to achieve it. Once we've achieved it, we try to sustain that target along the way. If we don't achieve it, we change therapies until we achieve that target. It's no different than blood pressure. We start with a thiazide, move to a beta blocker, move to an angiotensin converting agent until we achieve the target that we're trying to accomplish. So instead of treating to symptoms, we are treating to either biomarkers, endoscopic, or histologic healing. And so we've evolved. When you treat to symptoms, you improve their quality of life, but you don't change the natural history. As we evolve to biomarkers, that's where we're beginning to see advantages, as I will show you. With endoscopic improvement, mucosal healing, we reduce hospitalizations and surgeries, and if we get a deep remission, including histology, we can change the course and reduce the risk of cancer and ulcerative colitis. Now, a real practical problem for all of us is along the lines in rheumatoid arthritis, their goals for early RA, early rheumatoid arthritis before joint deformity, are different than the goals for once a patient has deformed joints because you can't improve structural damage. You can reduce progression, but you can't re get the fingers to straighten out um, in patients with RA once they are deformed. 
The same thing, we are going to have to modify our goals, and I think this is the next iteration that we get to. Because as we heard today, we're only achieving mucosal endoscopic healing in a quarter of the patients. So we're all getting patients referred to us. They've been treated to target, they don't receive, receive, the patient feels well, but they don't have endoscopic healing, and what do we do now? And that's our next issue. There is evidence, however, that if we incorporate biomarkers, we can actually improve that outcome. The REACT study treated patients either to symptoms or to biomarkers. Since all the patients were treated symptomatically, there were no differences in symptom outcomes, but differences in hospitalizations and surgery. And the most recent CALM study that Jean-Fred Colombel led randomized the same thing, dose escalation based on symptoms or dose escalation based on biomarkers or symptoms. When you look at clinical improvement with this, and I'll just show you the endpoint on the right, there were no differences. But if you look at endoscopic improvement, the patients who were treated to biomarker resolution actually did better. So uh, Bill Sanborn has been doing this in his practice. He's able to achieve about 60% endoscopic healing, and that's in a very aggressive approach. So our glass is half empty or half full. 60% is good, but it still leaves nearly half of the patients without that endpoint. And we're learning the factors that make it hard to achieve, and they're pretty obvious, just like the definition of pornography. Sicker patients are harder to get into remission. The more refractory they are, the less likely are they are to get into remission. And indeed, the, the data was shown this morning with ustekinumab at week 44, less than 20% of patients on the far right have endoscopic healing. You can get improvement, but not total resolution of ulcers. So what are we going to need to do? We're going to need to treat earlier. We're going to need to ensure a complete response. We utilize an optimized therapy, either with combination or treating to targets. We need to use pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So uh, I'll leave you with these conclusions and considerations and let Miguel talk about what's happening next steps on. Thank you.